I just want to thank the caretakers of this territory um, for housing such um, vision and such hope for the future and such love in these territories. Um, I brought my brother with me and we both felt it as soon as we landed. So thank you for continuing to take care of this space. The talk that I'm going to share with you today um, is called uh, Quilted Glyphs, Theories of Speculative Landings for Indians on the Move. Thank you. Um, so what I'm gonna share is a very, about 20 minutes of a thought experiment that I've been engaged with and activating um, not without being in relation. So the thoughts that I'm going to share have come from a series of conversations with mentors, with academics, with artists, with activists, um, with students, um, with colleagues. Um, so as I stand here, I recognize that I don't stand um, thinking through concepts and theories that have come just from me. So I'd like to acknowledge that. In creating this piece or set of provocations, written activation, I asked myself a series of questions that guide me throughout that include, what are some objects that I like to think with? Who are the thinkers, the artists that I like to think alongside? And finally, how is it that I want to feel when I do my work and when I do research? And how is it that I want others to feel? Um, as we collectively perform thought experiments with each other. In terms of my writing style, and uh, I just wanted to say that I appreciate all of the work coming from Adrienne Marie Brown, um, who articulates their approach to writing in theory embedded in a praxis that resists the Western desire for empirical data. And Adrienne Marie Brown says, I am writing this book primarily for other people like myself who crinkle our brows and lean away when someone starts speaking math, who fall asleep almost immediately when attempting to read nonfiction, but who get spun into wonder about the natural world and want to know things, who feel and know more than we can say or explain and want to know how knowing these things can transform the way we approach changing the world. And this is um, from the introduction of emergent strategy. So I think about this deeply, and I want to ask, how is it that I want to feel? And how is it that I want others to feel? And I feel that this integrates into my thinking on my own integrity as an Indigenous scholar. I want the people to feel heard, just as I want to feel heard. I want them to feel important, just as I want to feel important. I want them to feel cared for, just as I want to feel cared for. And I want them, I want you, to feel hopeful, just as I feel hopeful. So as I write, I write as a collage. And I think that collage is essential. It's essential to Afrofuturist practice as a technology to reconfigure new elements in places that have been abandoned or forgotten. And this is from Yahousi. It is the star glyph that is inspiring or housing these forms for me. This is why the star glyph, the star blanket, is so attractive as a form, as it houses young people that jump scale as a technology of the fall or as a landing device. It is important because, and this is where I bring up the people that I think with and I think alongside, are survivors of the child removal system, the 60 scoop survivors because they, we, have complex relationships to land, too. So my writing is written in star quilt collage in order to explore a theoretical framing that is layered, that is flattened out from wear in some areas 
edges that line up perfectly and my own imperfect edgings. I speak about a, warm, a worn star blanket as a refuge, as a home for theory. Like land, a star blanket glyph is also comprised of gestures, of provocations, relationships that are ongoing and sustaining. So I want to be clear that I am thinking alongside concepts, forms, ar archives, ideas, and worlds shaped and shared by fierce, courageous, thoughtful, and brilliant black scholars, writers, archivists, artists, such as Alexis Pauline Gooms, Camille Turner, Tiffany King, and a thinking through of quilts and blackness, quilts and indigeneities, quilts alongside theorizations and concepts shared by people like Billy Ray Belcourt, Tanya Lukin Linklater, Lindsay Nixon, Kirsten Lindquist, and other fierce and thoughtful brilliance. The star quilt for me has become a form to think alongside as a means of loving and surviving in post-apocalyptic conditions. These are archives providing the language of the act of falling, a landing glyph for those survivors of the fall that have lived through forced exiles and dispersals. Alexis Pauline Gums in the M archive speaks to her writing as, and I quote, work that is written in collaborations with survivors of the far into the future witnesses to the realities we are making possible or impossible within our present day apocalypse. This resonates with me because it is the survivors who are the futurists. They are the far into the future ancestors, witnesses, they are the ones who are the descendants of the fall and carry the processes, the protocols, the experiences, the toolkits of the fall in their bones, in the wreckage, but also in the interstices in between with the fleshiness of the hope and the survival tactics. We have already survived the apocalypse. Perhaps what is to come might be easier for us I think about the speculative as a space of possibilities for theory making, but also for life making. Perhaps now is the time to think about the collage as a technology, as a form to think alongside, as a star blanket. Mewena Yahousi, founder of the Black to the Future Collective, thinks about the apparatus and forms that could perhaps tell, unfold, and curate the world differently. And I think that the use of Afro and indigenous futurist languages helps to quilt worlds together. As I have written elsewhere, the collage acknowledges the integrity of the layers of substrata that weave a life. For scoop survivors, Collage holds space for the practices and processes of adaptations, role plays, and reversals that are necessary, necessary for being of sky, with a trajectory of landing into a place that may not be where one was born. This writing comes to you with an intention of communicating that the survivors of the indigenous child removal system are indigenous futurists, survivors of the apocalypse, with landing technologies that are expansive and multiscalular in the ways of a collage. I have a personal relationship to the star blanket because when I first came home, when I was 16, my mother, my birth mother, gifted me a star blanket. And when I met my grandfather for the first time on my dad's side, he also gifted me a star blanket. So now I'm gonna share a little bit about old man stone spirit, and forgive me if I don't say this right, Isinapeo Iwanau, is there any Cree speakers in the space? 
as Sinepeo Iwanau. Please know that I feel a little bit unprepared to talk about this being, as I am new to a relationship with Meteor, and my kinship with this being is still quite new, hesitant, shy, a little speculative. I was looking, and Archer Pachawas, in his home, had this gorgeous book in his house that I had heard about and I had been thinking about for a while. It was an intimidating book. It was Deanna Christensen's book about Atakakop. And I found in that book that Barry Ahenikyu had written about Old Man Stone, a more than human ancestor that connected with some ideas I had been walking with for a while. Ideas about meteoric flight, about landing and falling into place. I wanted to know about a star blanket's relationship with Asinapeo Iwano's forms of flight because I feel that we adoptees have fallen into place too. Like meteors, sometimes being carried across vast distances, across time and across space to be where we landed. As survivors of the apocalyptical mining of indigenous children, we adoptees never gave consent. Tobacco was not sent to the sky spirits, but they were witnesses to where we landed. We come from a genealogy of ancestors who placed their hope and dreams in the spaces and patterns of futurity bundles as a time traveling device wrapped in sema or kinikinik or tobacco. Within a methodology of landing, the glyph is the star blanket. The technology of the fall is through the star blanket, is through the Pleiades. I think alongside the star glyph for it being ancestor, rock, meteorite, a petroform, a form of traveling, a form of visiting, witnessing, and flight, as I learned from a story shared by Beria Hanekyu in Christensen's book, Atakako. In this massive, epic publication, Hanekyu shares the story shared with him by elders. This Cree story shared the relationship that exists between flight, the fall, and kinship that can help us envision a form of land-based relationship that centers forms of landing. In this story about a Sinepeo, old man stone spirit, I hear Cree theories of motion, the intelligence of Neheo people to produce a practice and protocol of flight through our relationship with stone, rock, clay, strata, providing a deeper understanding of care that gets mobilized in an urban diaspora. The sacred story was taped and transcribed in Cree and then translated into English by Frida Ahenikyu. A quote. There was also a Sinapeo Iwanau, old man stone. When the creator was planning how the sky and earth should go to mother, on Mother Earth, Okisikau, the sky spirit, asked, who will speak for the human people when they are put on Mother Earth? All the spirits were sitting around. I will. I will speak for the human people, as Sinapau Iwanau said. Some of the spirits sitting around asked Old Man Stone, how will you ever speak to them when you sit in one place all the time? Well, as Sinapau Iwanau replied, I travel all over the sky. Stones in the sky, of course, refer to meteorites, asteroids, and other celestial bodies. I sit all over the world. So from these places, I will listen to the human people. When a person is praying, when he is sounding pitiful to the creator, when he is thinking about the creator, I will listen and from there take their prayers to the creator. It was through the power of intelligence that people even learned to fly, the old man explained. Asinapeo Iwanau took them around it was said, Esene, the stone spirit, communicated knowledge of his power, his energy, to move 
their intelligence or things that they fly with around. This is how a Sinapeo Iwano old man stone spirit took them around so that they were able to fly. So when I think about this story, I think care in this context of landing looks like this. A Sinapeo Iwano took the people around, adopting a practice of embodiment and movement to move the people so that they were able to fly. This kind of care refuses the nation state's enclosure within a settler colonial structure of placing indigenous folks in care, a stronghold of violence, trafficking, and forceful dislocation. Landing is ideally to take place within the conditions of Cree sociality to be in kin. Our own kinships allowed us to move, to fall into spaces that were in kinship rather than in care. Our technologies of indigenous futurist travel, these kind ships, allowed us to fly within a structure of kinship, love, agentic movements. These were our movements. These were our landing practices. The star glyph maybe was a glyph to land. Our movements were guided by leaderships among kin that loved us. These forms of guided flight were non-possessive. As Asinapeo Iwano took the people around to move the people so that they were able to fly. Choreographies of the fall, therefore, can be seen as intentional moves to fly, as embodiments of the indigenous futurist collage amongst the strata of stars, atmospherics, dark matter, terrain, and sediment. For some of us, our gestures and movements are archived over and above ground to keep us safe. So you see, I am switching the narrative of lost in between worlds. I fly between worlds. I visit, I accomplice, I witness. In a multiscalar landing space, kins kinship centers atmospheric relations, those that were rooted in stars or sky fire. This opening in the middle of a star blanket, the hole, holds space for multiplexed origin stories that exceed beyond home or terrestrial territories. And within the space of this dark matter can emerge the possibility of an expansion of homeland to include celestial kinships that center movements that might be rupturous, might be jagged and tenuous, might be shy, but are also glyphed, somehow held together sewn together fractals, coding the atmospherics experienced during flight, therefore producing landing-based knowledges, maps to tomorrow that we can gift our children, our nieces, our nephews, our little humans that we love. Is it possible to conceive of a landing pedagogy that centers rock and rock's abilities to be of sky and of star? These beings, these stone relatives, these star relatives, illuminate the ways in which we can jump scale from certain orientations and worlding practices to others that are generative in their modes of flight. Consider the Cree and Ganyageha stories of sky being falling to the earth. We can be attracted, pulled into the speculative, because we recognize these patterns within our DNA. Rock has the capacity to hold space and hold itself within space and to fall to Earth, to Earth as an asteroid. Our futurity holders are star people. They fell, and we are descendants of these celestial motions. Our landing practices are what I like to call choreographies of the fall. The ways in which we orient ourselves towards each other, our relations, our kinning capacities are embedded in this motion of the fall. And perhaps it's not a singular fall. Perhaps we can think of this as the falls, 
the falling as a way of mobilizing indigenous forms of care and sociality with each other. This might encompass indigenous modes of care through gestures of the fall that we can embrace as the shapes of our gatherings. Star quilts are definitely objects, beings, that I'd like to get into relationship with. What are some objects, beings, that you would like to get into a relationship with? And perhaps think through this as an experience of research creation. So star quilting can be a way to determine how concepts feel within the body. Um, a way of getting inside a concept rather than approaching it from the outside. And I recognize all the artists in the room, and I know you know this. <laughs> Um, for, some, for those of us that aren't artists, it's harder to get inside of a concept. We have to really work hard at that. We have to learn how to dance. We have to learn how to quilt. We have to learn how to create. The animacy of beings of themselves, which place them in special relationship with research creation, are theoretical in and of themselves. They are not metaphors. They are not representations of theoretical concepts. They are. Um, so I choose to think alongside a star blanket as what I'm calling an indigenous femme glyph. Um, and I'm new to this, so what I'm sharing with you is my thought experiment. Um, so the middle of the star quilt is the place of medicine. And as star knowledge holder Wilfred Buck, who I, I hoped could come today, but he had to fly out to Saskatoon, talks about is um, Achak Akup is the star blanket. And the center point of the star blanket is the Pleiades, that hole in the sky um, through which Grandmother Spider um, weaves a thread upon which we practice our coding the atmosphere as we fall. So the Pleiades, the, the dark hole, the space through which we are lowered from sky world, I'm thinking that maybe this is a medicine place, the space where we grab the medicines for the fall. In an all-night performance that I was a part of on the banks of Lake Michigan in Chicago, I learned that tobacco, um, the plant, can pull out heavy metals. So it contains a healing property to pull out pollutants. And I'm trying to be careful with my P's on this. <laughs> you have to kind of step back or do a P like this, and it's hard. <laughs> um, it carries with it... Um, a delicate root system tobacco. So Lee Maracle calls it a time-traveling plant. It feels to me like digging and falling come together, that these gestures are connected. And I want to have some time to be in conversation with Rick, so maybe I'll just share this last little bit. Um, I have been in love with Alexis Pauline Goom's work in the M archive for quite some time, and I just wanted to maybe end with sharing some thoughts that Alexis has shared. When will the earth walkers be ready for depth? They started digging at the crossroads. Some had called it the intersection. And when they got through the pipes and the under asphalt wire currents and the knotted roots and the gravel and the grit and the cow footprints or whatever there had been before the blackening of the pavement, they started to see the layers, the shells, the bones. They started to remember, they started to know. As they dug and they dug, they got closer to home. So digging and flight come together as they are stories of emergence, of becomings, of witnessing layers, of witnessing stratifications, of the atmospherics of soil and sky. And I think muskrat going to the bottom of the river, of the lake, as part of this digging and flight as well. It's aqueous, too. I think alongside Laura Harjo's description of emergent geographies in my articulation of the significance of a star blanket as a landing technology, I also like to think how Adrienne Marie Brown articulates emergence 
whereas emergence is the way complex systems and patterns arise out of a multiplicity of relatively simple interactions. I see that as emergence and kinship being very, very, very closely related. If we see the star blanket as a being of becoming a way into relationality, a technology of relationality with each other or more than human kin facilitated by dark matter as an energy force of multitudinous potential, then we can also acknowledge star blankets as a technology of falling into a set of relationships and an emergent geography. Part of this thinking is in relationship with Sylvia McAdam, who's my, my cousin, and I just realized she was my cousin three years ago when I looked at her book and I saw that the foreword of it was written by my dad. <laughs> I was like, um, this is my dad. <laughs> But part of this thinking is in relationship with Sylvia McAdams' sharing of prophecies on building relationships with the underground, with the subaqueous, um, with the soil, with the clay, with the emergence that is underground, of how to be in darkness. The prophecies that we have to learn how to plant seeds in darkness, that this is perhaps a time to come but also in ti a time when we are already familiar with as we observe the atmospheric patterning of light within darkness. And our bodies were housed in that, the folding in of, of star blankets as a form of time travel, the creasing of time, the slipstreams, um, the patterns of light within darkness. And for me, I think that's the last sort of um, provocation I'd like to share with you is when I look at a star blanket, I think of light within darkness and how I think a long time ago people knew that that was going to be important for us. And in order to survive the apocalyptical time that we've experienced with 60 scoops, with residential schools, with trafficking of all kinds, then this is something that um, if we look to the teachings of um, a being that we like to walk alongside a star blanket, maybe there's something there. Maybe there's something there that we can carry into our future and to pass down to our loved ones. So this is the thought experiment at this point, and perhaps it's ready for a conversation. So uh, the index cards that some of you or all of you have been filling out, you could just sort of, you'll collect them? Okay, pass them to her and then we'll see what we can squeeze in. <laughs> so I got questions, lots of questions. Um, I'm not sure where to start, but in a way, like where do you start a, a quilt, right? Where do you start a collage? You just start at the start, so. Um, Something that uh, struck me, and there's a lot of things that struck me in your piece, um, I was struck by the notion of a diaspora, and um, which you describe as a forced exile and dispersal, um, an exile from one's traditional territories. And we often hear of a Jewish diaspora, an, an African diaspora. I don't hear much about an indigenous diaspora. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that in terms of uh, how our populations were displaced and dispersed, and to this day, I mean, um, to me it seems the apocalypse is still ongoing, right? We're living it, uh, those of us who are in the millennial, or the millennium rather, scoop that's going on. So, why do you think we don't hear about this concept of a diaspora when it, when it, when it comes to indigenous populations? I mean, at least in, 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 in the mainstream, uh, discourse? I think part of that is, uh, I think part of the, 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 the framing or the language of the diaspora has really been um, honoring black um, diasporic um, conditions and movements. And 
I think coming from black studies and um, I think that that concept has really been helpful um, to kind of think through blackness. Um, so indigenous folks um, thinking through diaspora is something that I, I'm, I'm kind of working through and working with because in all the work that I've been doing lately, I've been thinking about these very strong um, ties and relationships to land that indigenous and black folks have. Um, and uh, in terms of diaspora, I, I guess I'm gonna go back to the star quilt and say that I look at that shape of the star quilt as showing that you know, we, we have always been on the move. You know, we've always been, um, We've always been in motion, um, and sometimes the concepts that we use to describe these motions have a way of, um, I guess, taking away some of the intentions of those movements. Mm. So I don't want to put too much um, focus on diaspora. I think more so what um, the work is doing is it's, um, it's, it's trying to, the intentions of the work are to show that, yes, there are certain maps that have been laid out for us, but the, the relationships that we have to time and space are more than just terrestrial, but they're also celestial. And so I don't know the language yet to describe those sorts of expansive, expansive motions and expansive movements I do, I do use the term diaspora, but um, I think it's way more, our movements and motions are way more expansive than that. Yeah, no, I, I, I think perhaps embedded in the concept of being exiled is this idea that you're alienated from your home territory and you don't want, you, you, you want to dispel the, the, the audiences for your work of that notion that that, that necessarily has to happen, that there's, mm -hmm. a, there's an active move to reconnect. Mm -hmm. and, and re rethread, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. Am I so? Am I? Am I? Am I getting you? <laughs> I guess so. I mean, um, <laughs> um, oftentimes when we talk about like indigenous uh, scoop survivors, we get into this weird headspace of, oh, you you must be caught in between two different worlds, mm -hmm. um, and. I think my work is trying to move beyond those kinds of like binaries. I think we have way more worlds than just two worlds. <laughs> I like to hope that there is more, more, more to us. There are many worlds. There are many suns. There are, you know what I mean. There's, um, so, for some, you know, I feel like a return home can be way more expansive than, than um, the language and the discourse that surrounds people talking about 60 Scoop survivors. And that's why in the work I, I really want to really want to mention that like I feel like survivors are, off, are, are indigenous futurists. Like they're the futurists because they have survived the fall. <laughs> you know, they've survived the landing practices. Um, and, and so what I'm offering is um, an alternative uh, way of thinking that I think a lot of us live through. Um, and the languages of adoptees have not quite, the, sometimes they don't quite get there, you know? Sometimes they don't quite get to acknowledge the expansiveness of, um, of, of experience, I guess, and of, of movement that a lot of folks are doing. Mostly the artists, I'm really, quite amazed, and the poets. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, something that struck me, I mean, just thinking about your main title, uh, choreography, uh, I mean, this, your piece today is connected to another piece that was sent to me early uh, to, mm -hmm. to help me uh, try and sit with, with your thoughts, and the original piece was choreographies of the fall, and, um, you know, my, the language uh, I most speak, <laughs> I really am only fluent in, is, is English, and that wasn't my choice, and I'm speaking about that in a larger sense. Mm -hmm. um, English 
the connotations of the word fall are, they're not positive usually. Um, they're almost traumatic. It's associated with, with fear, fear of falling or failure. So you, you fall from grace, you slip and fall, you fall on your face. Uh, if you're into sports, you're falling in the standings. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I'm wondering if you can speak more about what the fall means in, in, in indigenous understandings. And I mean, there's, it's interesting to me that there is a st the story of the fall of the sky woman in, in Cree and in Mohawk. I mean, there, there's a, there's a there, that, that's interesting to me that two different peoples would, would. Uh, and more. And yeah. more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, so how do we get, I, I'm assuming you're not, I mean, to me, the, the, the fall seems liberatory in your formulation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I think also it comes from, I appreciate the question because yes, but for folks that have been, um, and I say this carefully because I don't know how many of us 60 Scoop survivors are in the room. I speak from my experience, but um, for my experience, the rupture has already happened. Um, when I was, you know, when I was t taken, um, the rupture has already happened. So that's big, right? So everything after that is a fall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You become quite, you become a navigator. You become an indigenous futurist. You, you become these things out of necessity. The fall is scary as hell. So, but, and, <laughs> um, you fall into, you, you fall, you ascend, they're kind of the same thing. Like, it's like this. You know, that's the kind of positioning and orientation, cartographic, navigating maps to tomorrow that I think is important to keep in mind is that it's like this. You know, we fall up, we fall down, we fall this way, we fall that way. <laughs> you know, um, it's a circuitous kind of falling. And it is very rupturous and it is very scary. Um, and we fall in love with rupture over and over again, because we have to. And I think that's okay. Like, I, I think a fall is, is okay. A fall is tenuous. You're coding the atmosphere as you're falling. You're coding the atmospherics up as you're falling. You're visiting. There's all these stories about, like, um, uh, the fall and, and visiting in all the different layers of the atmosphere. So in some indigenous belief systems, there's this idea that as you come into this world, you're visiting. So you're, you're visiting relations. You're, you're getting sort of teachings on how to be when you land. So I, don't, I think that's happened for everybody. Like I don't, I feel like we're, we're constant visitors as we fall. It's not just like a, a free fall. We're, we're intentionally visiting. We're intentionally building kin and building relationships as we're, as we're falling. And our hair gets all crazy and velocity, <laughs> wind, <laughs> like it's, it's probably quite nuts. It's probably quite an experience. Um, but Tiffany King, actually, I did a, a talk um, with my colleague Susan Blight and some other amazing folks. Um, Kirsten Lindquist was there, and and you know, we were we were thinking about the fall. And Tiffany King asked, "Well, how who do you fall into?" And I think that's another question: Who are you? Who are you falling into? And how do you fall into? a set of relationships, a set of kinships. So people who are of the fall, who practice a choreography of the fall, you know, I think it's those gestures of, of having relationality in the fall 
that is really key. Hmm. There's a lot of um, pressure to uh, fix indigenous identity in place. There's, there's, a, there's a rigidity, there's a reductiveness, mm. there's an essentialization of it. And mm. so to me, that's, those are the things I was thinking about, thinking about being fluid and in motion, your emphasis on that, that we shouldn't uh, try to fix us in place or time or space, that we can be this ever-changing body. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that, that's where my mind went because so often we're, we're pushed to conform to a certain set of characteristics or we're supposed to look a certain way, supposed to act a certain way. And that's not, I, I, I mean, and guess where that idea comes from? It doesn't come from, from within our, <laughs> our, own, our own understandings, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, is that part of is that part of the mix of, of what you're trying to get at? Mm -hmm. and, it, and I think it's also in those protocols and practices of visiting that um, that are really indicative of a way of thinking about being expansive. And also, and I'm going to take a chance here, also of thinking that and this is what I've learned from readings from Sylvia Winter, um, Dion Brandt, like thinking through what does it mean if it's okay not to belong? <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> what, it, hmm. what does that do? Does it free us? Is it sad to think that? I, I just want to let that be. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so um, <laughs> as we've, as we, as, well, I always feel that pressure to, to fill the void. Um, Don't. Dark <laughs> matter is good. <laughs> um, but I thought kinship was synonymous with belonging. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I'm not. <laughs> ha, got you. No, I'm not trying to. No, I'm just. I'm just. What is this? This is me just thinking it out. I don't. I'm not. You know, I'm just trying to be fluid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Kinstellatory is something that I've been thinking about. You know. Um, and this is you taking, I had to think about that the first time I heard that word, um, mm -hmm. uh, constellation and kin, and you're kind of, okay. Yeah, I'm putting them together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting them together for, you know, a few reasons. Um, and, you know, to me it's about a set of relationships that is about the fall and ascendancy, like ascending and falling and moving um, and it's about building relationality in tenuous spaces, you know, mm -hmm. um, building relationality in spaces where perhaps that relationship isn't supposed to be. What is that work? Um, um, land, landing, landing puts the focus on movement um, and on movement that is consensual and on movement that is tenuous in the sense that you don't know where you're going to land. But the processes that you embody and gesture Um, in some ways, to find a la like your land. Um, we all don't have the same relationships to land. They're all different. And I think it's because the landing practice 
is careful. It's, it's nuanced. It's, um, it's not the same for everybody. So you can talk about that in terms of identity, indigenous identity. You could talk about it in different ways, but I think our landings are not, are not the same. We're not a monolith? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, that makes it more complicated. Um, so um, it's funny, when you were just speaking just now, the, the, the word hip hop came into my mind. Mm -hmm. And as some people may have gathered off the top, you're a huge hip hop fan. And in fact, th that's how we first connected, was talking about your PhD mm -hmm. in another life. Mm -hmm. um, and one way people describe hip hop is making something out of nothing, hmm. right? Taking whatever you have at your disposal and making something new, right? Hmm. And one example of that is sampling, right? Taking, is, taking disparate. Is sound? Sampling. Sampling. Sampling yeah. sounds, right? Mm -hmm. Taking different recordings and then integrating them. And then to me, that just seems to line up perfectly with collage. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Done. <laughs> no, cool. <laughs> no. So you, okay, you agree. I'm not uh, pulling this out of air. Out of no, I, I agree. And, and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I think that's important for us to, to kind of keep thinking and keep expanding our worlds. And um, I started researching Indigenous hip hop, you know, and, um, and I'm always interested in seeing where my relations are taking me. <laughs> <laughs> now my relations are taking me towards star blankets and Maybe they always have in some ways. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this journey, this little form of flight that I'm going on. Um, but yeah, it's always been about collage. Now I have a name for it. Hmm. Do you actually collage? I collage in my writing. Okay. My writing practice is collage. I, Kelly and I are going to start making a star blanket together for our birth, well, my birth mother, his birth mother, obviously. Um, so we're going to collage together. And I didn't meet Kelly till I was 16 and he was five. And all I remember Kelly saying to me when I was, when I was, uh, when I met him was, I had, I had him for a little while. We, we went camping together and I made him go to bed and he was five and he said, Boy, Karen, you're just mean. <laughs> He's loving this. Remember He's that. Really yeah, no, stuff. I'm just glad that, you know, like our, 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 our trees, our genealogy sometimes are more collage, you know, and sometimes we're just um, lucky to have, to, to land in, at the right time, at the right hmm. space. And to acknowledge that landing as something that was supposed to happen, that did happen, thank God. So, mm hmm Okay, I, I have a question. Yes. On this index card. I see it. Yeah. Karen. Yes, Rick. <laughs> Why did you decide to incorporate black futurist thinkers in your work? Oh, nice. Um... So I, I heard about uh, Octavia Butler, <laughs> like superhero, super fierce being that Octavia Butler's work is. And I feel like um, I started to think about time travel and archive and future selves and thinking through how the Dogon people think about like star beings, like they come from the stars. And that really resonated with what I was learning about where we come from as Cree people. And um, I started to see some relationships between Afrofuturism and indigenous futurism. And I wanted to, to, to honor those Afrofuturist thinkers um, and creators that are still creating incredible work 
about dreaming up otherwise worlds. And I started to see that through writing and poetry and prose, um, a lot of the same ideas like seedlings, you know, seedlings being dropped in darkness and finding light, you know, a lot of things about like dreaming of otherwise worlds were really, really resonating with me, especially during the time when, you know, I was a single mother at this time when I started really thinking through and reading a lot of work that, you know, we were experiencing this onslaught of violence, um, particularly towards indigenous folks, um, you know, thinking through trans, queer, two-spirit, um, indigenous femmes, like thinking through all of this violence and, and raising a child, I was thinking, how can I dream otherwise? I need to dream otherwise. I need to leave a map to tomorrow for Gracie so that, well, it was just important for me to do that. So I was reading about like metamorphosis and change, phoenixes, fire. I became really obsessed with fire. <laughs> and um, when I was a single parent, I was thinking, okay, well, people are always talking about like fire keepers. Where's my fire keeper? I remember thinking like all these indigenous like male defining folks are like talking about fire being fire keepers, but I wanted a fire keeper. You know, I wanted somebody to keep my daughter and myself safe, you know? And I remember thinking, um, thinking that and then realizing you know, a while down the road, that I had to be the fire keeper. Like, I had to be water carrier, fire keeper, all in one. I had to be superhero. And then I read um, some work by uh, Nadia Korfor called The Phoenix, which was about fire, fire wielding. And then I thought about fire bending and all these like really beautiful fire constellatory like relationships. So I think I came into Afrofuturism thinking about star and fire and water and the possibilities of otherworlding through fire and otherworlding through these um, through through these metamorphoses, these um, being a changeling was something that was really important to me, <laughs> like considering myself a changeling you know, who can, who can be fire and water at the same time, who could hold space for that within my body and within my gestures. Um, I was very drawn to Nadia Korafor's The Phoenix and also the book Who Fears Death. Um, wow, just, they, they introduced me to this idea of flight and of otherworlding. The work of Vishan Crawley is important to me otherwise possibilities, otherwise movements. Um, it's, it, it, re, it ignited a fire, I think, in me. It was part of the appeal, too, that for so long, we've been written off by, by settler colonial societies, and uh, I'm, so I'm speaking of indigenous populations around the world, like, we were not supposed to be here. We were supposed to be done. We were supposed to be obliterated, and for some odd reason, we've persisted. So. But it's one thing to get here. <laughs> People have worked very hard. No, to of course. Of course. <laughs> but it's one thing to get here. It's it's a it's another thing. It's a radical thing to imagine we'll be here tomorrow in the in the face of all that. Was that part of the appeal? Was it? How much of that was? Yeah. At play. Yeah, yeah. I guess the fact that I think people have like fought really hard and people have prayed for us. Um, a lot of those earlier ceremonies and, and ceremonies that continue into the future were all about, you know, time traveling and, and giving gifts in spaces. So, um, yeah, we weren't supposed to be into the future according to the settler colonial kind of um, trajectory but we were supposed to be here according to the indigenous mm -hmm. um, thinkers, activators, artists, ceremonialists, healers. Yeah, so if we listen to the settler colonial, you know, thread, loop, yes.
but there's very different ideas about our persistence and our, res our, our ongoingness um, coming from our ancestors that had to be incredibly powerful. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I know it's just, I've been coming up again and again against this idea that, yeah, we get a past, we get a distance, romanticized past, mm -hmm. or we get a past that's just, just looking at all the trauma, mm -hmm. and maybe we get a present, but we rarely get a future. And people don't think of us in that way. I mean, in the, in the mainstream, in the overculture. Yeah. Uh, another question here from the floor. Oh, if I just may. Oh, um, we, we, we are so grateful for our future. You know, we, um, I remember having a moment with my daughter when I was, you know, that single mom, you know, living in Toronto. I just started my job at U of T. And I remember she had turned, she was turning five. And that was the age when, you know, my biological mother um, was taken to residential school. That was the age that, you know, I wasn't with my mom when I was, my biological mother when I was five. So having her with me turning five mm. was very, very important. You know, I, I honored that with a little ceremony with Gracie. Um, was there some ambivalence too? Sorry? Was there some ambivalence too, just because of the significance of that year? Um, I don't like, did it bring understand. Up some, I mean, it must have, obviously it's a positive thing, but it must have maybe brought up, channeled some old negative. Well, what it did was that it made me a futurist because it made me have a ceremony with my daughter and be like, we are together, you know? Mm. You're with your mom. I'm with you, and you're five. <laughs> and how wonderful is that? You know, so um, I think that we create our own, our, like I'm sure we have our own ceremonies. You know, we, we do our own, um, we do our own thing. You know, and when you talk about the diaspora, the city, you know, People, indigenous people have always done these things in this space, you know. I look at that um, mural of the, the star blanket that's really close to this building, you know, and I think, wow, you know, it just gives me the chills, like, to think that this is all cared for indigenous space, like, that, that we've always been futurists. Like before we, we have learned about these, these um, before we talked about indigenous futurism as we talk about it now, we were always futurists. So, yeah. Also, I don't know if that answers your question. I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> it's okay. But I just really needed to share that story about Gracie and I because um, we've we've always been futurist thinkers, you know, and to be a futurist thinker, actually, I believe, also means that we don't believe in this utopic vision that's free of rupture. We acknowledge the rupture, you know, and maybe that's the ambivalence question, I'm just getting it now. Like, <laughs> we, acknowledge, <laughs> we acknowledge the rupture. And in that moment, Gracie and I acknowledge the rupture. She could see it on my face, she might not have understood it, but she saw it. Yeah. Well, too, I mean, it just prompts a thought that, that I shared with you uh, in a discussion we had uh, across the street. And just, you know, you, you talked about dichotomies, and a lot of people dichotomize the res and cities, right? Mm -hmm. Urban and, and remote, right? These are, the, these are the, the bifurcations people create or impose on us as if the city is alien, but the city was built on indigenous land. Like indigenous yeah. peoples moved on and through th this territory. And if we excavate this city, figuratively and literally, right, we would find traces of yeah. us, right? And maybe we would fall through the sky then, right, if we dug too deep. <laughs> if I'm understanding all of this, uh, <laughs> all these metaphors. Anyway, let's get off of my well, question. That's, that's oh. true. Like I, I, also, I also feel like you know, 
there's, of course, they built the cities where cities already existed. Like they built the cities where people were in relation. And with then they each call other. the city alien us to us. It's like, no, not at all. This is our home. Yeah. You built it on our home. Yeah. But I find it is really beautiful how indigenous folks are tagging the cities. So you look at Joy Arcan's work, you know, you look at um, Casey Adams, who is just here, you know, you look at, you look at all of this work where people are spatially tagging indigenous land through neon. Isn't that awesome? Through like hot pink. I love that, <laughs> you know, because our people have always been in love with color, you know, and with light. So the city, the, 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 the surge, the, the vibrations of the city, the settlers didn't put that there. We put that there. Mm -hmm. We put the vibration into the city. Not we, I can't say that I did, but indigenous folks, indigenous to this territory, put that vibration there. And we still feel it. And it's still being put out daily. For some reason, it just popped in my head. I mean, beadwork is a kind of collage too, right? You're taking all these tiny little fragments and then bringing yeah. them together to create. Anyway, that just definitely. Popped. And <laughs> and beadwork is also a, a, like a, a beautiful form of like coating the atmosphere. You know, coating the atmospheres. It's right. it's a, a beautiful way of coating kinship hmm. and relationalities that are expansive. And interesting too. Some bead. They have, an, they have a quote-unquote imperfection in their beading mm -hmm. to sort of... Yeah. We love rupture. Right, I was going to say, I was going to say. <laughs> we don't love rupture, but we accommodate rupture. rupture and we love design. our rupture selves. Another question here uh, from the floor. How These questions are beautiful, by the way. Wow. How might memory fit into your theory of falling and landing? Mm. Can I sit with this question for a little while? So we'll all Can you back ask tomorrow. it again? <laughs> How might memory fit in with my theory of falling and landing? I think it's a brilliant question. Thank you, whoever asked it. <laughs> I might not have the capacity to answer it right now, but whoever asked that question, I'd love to be in conversation with you. Where does it push you, though? Where does, it, where does your mind go thinking about it? Mm -hmm. not, not in terms of a definitive answer, but just like... <laughs> I just need to think about okay. it. Okay, all right. Sorry. So just one last question, because, I, I mean, I would have loved to have just, you know skillfully and seamlessly um, segued into it, but um, a word I noticed you didn't use, and this has been in academia, I think a very loaded word. Uh, some would even call it pejorative, uh, dismissive, um, a cudgel as a way to undermine our connections to territory. So. Um, I'm just going to try and stretch this out as long as possible without actually using the word. And so I want to know if you didn't use it on purpose. And that word is nomadic. Oh. Which has implications of people, you know, moving from place to place to place. But it's often been used as a, as a disparagement to say, well, you guys have no attachment to land anyway. You're not using this land properly. You don't understand, you know, you don't even understand property. You're nomads. <laughs> yeah. And yet, I mean, there's a way, you, you repurpose a lot of the English language to, to fit indigenous purposes, right? So was that a deliberate choice to stay away from, from that maybe? I, 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 like, this is what I'm curious about, or is it just me kind of being a little too nerdy? Well, you definitely are nerdy. What? What? That's it. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so yes. Um, when I think about uh, being on the move, I'd like to think alongside Lou Catherine Cornham's work, 
that talks about the space Indian and like <laughs> being landlocked. Um, and, you know, what does it mean to acknowledge our movements when we have always been on the move? So nomadic is a word that I don't really waste my time thinking about. Um, however, we, I feel like our movements are, are, continue to be within a specific trajectory of purpose and intention as they always have been. You might want to call that nomadic, people on the move. Just because you're on the move, it doesn't mean that you don't have a desire for deep intimacy with land. Sometimes being on the move means that you do have a desire for deep intimacy with land and with each other. It doesn't cancel each other out. When I enter into a relationship with a new sister, for example, I'm landing. When I enter into a relationship with a new auntie, I'm landing. And they can live far away from me, and I'm still landing. You might want to call that nomadic, I, I guess that's okay. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's really bogus to use as an insult. I mean, you have populations that come from over across the ocean from another place and plot themselves down. I mean, they're, they're nomads vis-a-vis -vis their original <laughs> territories. Yeah. Yet for some reason, when, when we move around, and we're not moving across oceans, uh, <laughs> Anyway, um, do we have other questions from the floor? No? Okay. All right. So I've, we, I've hogged a lot of your time here. You've gone over the, the allotted. Okay. <laughs> I, I appreciate all the questions. I think that they're beautiful. And I'd like to sit with a couple of them. So a few, all of them, actually. Okay. So thank you for, for that. I didn't write mine on cards, though. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Karen Reckolet, thank you very much. Thank you.